Hello everybody, we're back to my crappy basement office to do the filming again. So, uh, today our lesson is going to be on inflation and bubbles because I don't think, I, I came upon an epiphany, it's one of those things I knew intuitively, but um, for some reason it never went from the back of the head to the front of the cerebral cortex, like, oh yeah, translate into English. And I think it will really help a lot of people understand um, inflation and bubbles. Uh, as we seem to have a lot of them <clears throat> today. Uh, now, let's start with this. Okay, why are diamonds so valuable? Right? And what I want you to do, take away the concept of value. Take away the concept of, I want you to forget everything you ever thought you knew about inflation, bubbles, I can honestly just wipe this slate clean. Let's just focus on diamonds right now. What makes diamonds so valuable? And I'm even using that word wrongly. If you think about it, uh, diamonds don't really do anything. They don't. I, there is an industrial diamonds, those you could use to cut things, but if you think about gem quality diamonds, they really don't do anything except make girls say, look at what this sucker just bought me. He bought me this rug. He, he forfeited a significant percentage of his finite life to buy me this stupid rock. Do you see how stupid that guy is? You see what a sucker... Look how big that rock is. This is why girls always compare. And most of the, it's not about like how big the diamond is. It's how much of a sucker are you to work away for that worthless piece of glass. That's what it was. Right? There is no value to diamonds. But, now think about this. Diamonds are not common. They're rare. And if you take all the money in the world that could be spent on diamonds, you realize that the number of diamonds per unit of currency or per dollar is very small. Or if we inverse that ratio, the amount of money that's out there for the puny little amount of carats of diamonds that are in this world is huge. There are so few diamonds. They are so rare that the money that could be spent on them drives the price up. Notice this has nothing to do with value. Nothing to do with value. It doesn't matter if there's a practical application of the diamonds. It is the fact that diamonds are not common that gives them at least rarity and value in that regard. Drives the price up. Same thing, for example, this is how I got on the original idea. <clears throat> you know me, I come up with stupid crazy ideas because anything's better than working in banking or the financial services. And most of my ideas are better than banking. And this, who knows, this might actually work. Maybe there's some... Um, uh, aerospace engineers out there that can figure this one out. Do you know what the value of moon rocks are? I think I looked it up. It's like $160,000 per ounce. You want to know why moon rocks are so much more valuable than diamonds? Look it up. I forgot what, but they're much more valuable than diamonds. Because there's less moon rocks than there are diamonds. They're so, I think the only moon rocks we got was from the Apollo missions when, when the United States went up to the, the, um, the moon and brought, brought some stuff back. That's it. That's the supply of moon rocks. What do moon rocks do? I imagine nothing different than what earth rocks do. They sit and do nothing. They're inert. Nothing, they don't, they, do they have a functional practical purpose? No. It is the rarity that drives their quote-unquote value, even though they have no productive or income-generating potential. They're just moon rocks. They just, well, here's some moon rocks. What do they do? They sit, kind of like, you know, and they're at least, they're at least, you know, you can't say, look at these suckers we sent to the moon. Yeah, that's like pretty kick-ass. They went to there, and that's why probably moon rocks have a little bit more value. That it took a little bit of effort to go up and back, and so you have the moon rocks. But the larger point is the moon rocks don't do anything. So even though there's no production, they still have value because of the rarity. And so this aspect of, of value, if you want to call it that, uh, which has nothing to do with income generating potential, it's not like a stock that has earnings or a dividend or something like that, uh, it should show you that what drives the price of something is the amount of money that's going to be spent on the amount of stuff that's available. In other words, it is a money per unit of stuff, money per carat of diamond, money per pound of moon rock and and so you see that is what it is so if you can understand that concept you take all this money divided by the amount of stuff that's available you understand inflation and bubbles way better than uh, better than uh, uh, even introducing the concept of income and 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 profit and return on investment okay now 
none of you know, diamonds. Yeah, everyone's gonna run into diamonds. Uh, moon rocks, maybe most of us won't ever run into it. But take two big things now today that uh, everyone seems to need, and we have a right to, or the left is pushing for us to have a right to. And it's always so expensive, and we don't know why the costs keep going up. And that is health care and education. Okay. Now, I just got back from the doctor, went in, I had a thing. And it's great because being self-employed, I have catastrophic life insurance. And uh, I had, like, I was working out, and I had this bump on my chest. Well, I'm sure it's cancer. It's not, so I guess I'll be around to piss you all off for the many, many years to come. But I went in, and... They say, okay, fill this out, and they give me another sheet, fill this out, and it's my insurance form. Well, my, my um, catastrophic doesn't cover minor little visits like this. i got to go over a certain threshold. So I just say, oh, I'm paying cash. And the gal behind the desk looked at me like she didn't know the, what the English words were coming out of my mouth. And I just had my credit card right there. I'm like, yeah, there you go. She's like, oh, so you just want, I'm like, yeah, I'll just pay for it now. You don't want us to build? No, don't be pay for it now. And it then dawned on me that... It is so rare for people to just actually pay for their own shit in the healthcare world that it's that they didn't know what to do or they were actually you know taken aback, not an insult, but just kind of like, whoa, this guy's paying cash. So I only spent 10 minutes with the doctor, and it cost me 164 bucks. Now I understand there's overhead and all that, but that translates into a, an annual salary at you know 40 hours a week of two million dollars a year. Now our doctor's worth it. Okay, fine, whatever. I'm not gonna say, it. but two million dollars a year just to look and poke. Okay, it's not cancer, thank you. All right. Uh, that was 164 bucks. It shows to me that the doctor... I'm, I'm not saying she wasn't uh, worth her weight in gold. I'm not saying that she didn't do a good job. What I'm saying is that there is so much money being poured into this industry that it drives prices up. Again, there's a limited amount of health services that can be provided, and we throw all this money in it. Now, where does the money come from? Okay. Well, here's why your health insurance is so damn expensive. Again, reverting back to our very simplistic model of money in the world to moon rocks, money in the world to diamonds. There's not just how much money are you willing to spend on healthcare, because it's beyond that. It's how much insurance you are not really even, since you're not paying for your own healthcare, you could get insurance companies and other people to pay for your healthcare, not to mention the government. That's why your health care is so expensive. That's why it costs $164 for a doctor to go poke and say, okay, you don't have cancer. Right? We not only have private money. Okay, so here's private money dumping into this set amount of uh, fixed amount of health services that could be provided. We not only have private money, but you have government money. You have Medicare, Medicaid, um, all the various state, all these different programs. Right? Has the amount of supply of health care changed? Not really. All you've done is poured twice the amount of money, and not to mention insurance, into this fine. So on a money, not just what you're willing to spend, but insurance and government and private money per unit of health care, that's driving it up to the point it's probably more insane than moon rocks. Right? Education, your colleges, it's another perfect example. All you really intelligent college kids. Oh, you're so educated. Oh, where is tuition going? It's the main Republicans. My professor says the evil conservatives and George Bush. I mean, you guys are the dumbest people ever. I mean, and you, so, and are you forced to take economics? Well, that's right. Your economics teacher wasn't me and probably a socialist douchebag on top of it. So you never really understood simple concepts like currency to moon rocks. Uh, but think about education. This is no different. What if you had to pay cash? You couldn't borrow money. Does the amount of professors in universities change? No. There's just less money available to spend on it. So what do you think is going to happen to money spent per unit or per measure or per professor? It's going to go in half. Easy. But again, since education is the most important thing in the world, even though if you major in international studies like our president and don't produce a damn lick of good in your world, uh, th that's still worth it, we're going to borrow trillions, actually, of dollars over the course of the years. And all that does is increase the amount of money up here into the fixed, finite amount of education down here. If you want the price of education to come down, you want tuition uh, dollars to drop, well, it would take a little bit of doing, but all you college kids would have to do is simply say, I'm not attending. and and Or, in a theoretical world, we just cut off borrowing for uh, college. You cannot borrow money for college. You have to pay for cash. And then, 
I bet you those professors who have really no employment prospects and the only place they could work is academia because they got a doctorate in English and we live in the United States, I bet you they'll be real agreeable to come down in terms of what they're paid for salary and their health care costs and their pension costs. I mean, I think if it came to zero dollars or having, having, H-A-L-V-I-N-G, having, halving, having, cutting things in half, cutting the salary in half, they'll take half a salary. They will, because their, their other option is to what? Go sit there and twiddle their thumbs? Because that's all they're going to do. They're going to collect a check, a government check, and it ain't going to be anything as big as what they, you know, half their income is today. So the lesson here is that you can, you can use the simple model to understand where there's bubbles and why there's inflation. Ask yourself, how much of a supply is there? I know it's supply and demand, but I'm, I'm, I'm simplifying it or I'm maybe taking a slightly different spin on it. Assume the amount of supply is fixed, which doesn't happen in the long run. Just assume it is. And ask how many sources of money go into that, it could be spent on that finite supply of stuff. If, you, if you're just spending your own money like cash, I'm trying to think like fast food. You ever hear of a bubble in the fast food industry? No, because like you usually pay cash for your McDonald's hamburger. But when it comes to education, okay, uh, health care, uh, housing, there's another perfect example. You then go beyond paying for cash. Other sources of cash come in and inflate the value or the price. I shouldn't say value. It inflates the price of what you're trying to per uh, purchase. So in terms of housing, here's another perfect example. You had you had all three again. You had all three sources of, of money. Private money, your own, cash. Then you had borrowing money. You could borrow money from the banks. Then you even had the government coming in and helping you with tax deductions on your interest, not to mention giving you credits and, and low income and blah, 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 all those various programs. Healthcare, same thing. You have your own private money. You pay cash. But then we're going to triple the price if necessary by adding government money and people will sometimes, insurance, I guess. People will borrow, but we're going to have insurance on top of that. Education, same thing. You could have just pay for cash, pay for it for yourself. But no, we just love you children so much. We love you so much. The children are our future. So we're going to make you borrow money and go in debt because we, we value you so much and your education is so important. We're going to loan money to you and that's just going to double the price of tuition. <laughs> so so uh, think about that. that I, I guess that's the best way I can uh, use to describe how inflation works and how bubble, bubbles form. And uh, it also should go a, a long way and explain why you can't just print off more money uh, to solve all your problems. So hopefully this economic lesson helped. Go spread the good word. Piss off all the socialists and the leftists. And that's it. Toodles.